Welcome again to American Zarathustra. This is episode 17 of Imperium Art. We are extremely pleased to have a very special guest with us today. Z my hero, Zero. Zero Schizo, how are you today, sir? I'm all good. Thank you, Donald, for <laughs> the invitation. Oh, it's it's just a, it's really an honor to have you here. Um, and then also my friend and co-host, Nullis, how are you today? I'm doing fine, Donald. Thank you very much. Hello to the audience and welcome. It's an honor to have you, Zero. Indeed. So, Zero, we like to start off the show with letting everybody get to know you, you our guests and uh, your content. So let, let's just tr try to get right into that. So, you know, after that, we'll, we'll discuss Imperium Art, your views on that. Um, you have a, an, a very impressive background of content development. You write for the Revolutionary Conservative website, uh, Augustus Invictus's uh, publishing platform. And of course, you do your own show, and you've been a guest on many, many shows in the dissident right, alt right sphere. So, and also, you're from Peru. So, one of our goals with this show is that we want uh, our North American and European audiences to bridge more into uh, South America and th that whole experience. So we have a lot of questions for you and we're very excited to get your impressions of Imperium Art. So if you could just introduce yourself and, and tell us about the content you create, your your links, websites, etc. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And as you may say, get it from my accent. I actually don't live in the United States. I live in, I reside in my country, my mm -hmm. home country and live in the capital. I have been, have been traveling uh, around my country and many other countries from the region for, for like a very long time, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, during this time I have managed to make a very good, uh, managed to develop really good relations with many nationalist uh, third position or for political theory organizations uh, around uh, South America. But uh, in Europe, we also, uh, I also managed to get into contact with other much more older organizations like, for example, Greece, uh, Grece, sorry, Greece, Greece or Grece? Greece. I don't know in Greece. how you, how, no, no, no. Uh, uh, this is the name of the organization. Okay. Which is from the, uh, from the French New Right. Oh, wow, very good. That's their, yeah, that's their, uh, the name of their think tank, G-R-E-C-E. -E. Very Just good. Just like without the, the other E, yes. uh, the Palat. We'll have, used, we'll have to get uh, Flash Gorgon on. He speaks French very well, so. <laughs> but go on, I I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with them, uh, with other movements, like the identitarian uh, movement, uh, funny because uh, here, down, at least in my country, we can say that we are nationalists, but we are identitarian too. For for us, those two are in synthesis. They are not a contradiction because, for example, I have seen many different people struggling to understand uh, identity and they just adopt that race is just the identity. No, they, there is not like uh, perhaps a, nationalist, a national identity. Uh, they, they are just identified with the race or Sometimes others just identify with the with the continent they are they residing for for us that's not the case we are like in the middle between we are nationalists but we also recognize our identity as unique in our own continent and our own civilization mm -hmm. but at the same time we are also continentalists which means we push for a continental geopolitical union as, as a geopolitical bloc instead of just saying you know we are all going to be the European Union with the Spanish subtitles mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that, okay, yeah. that's not that's not the idea where we are pushing is for a geopolitical independent bloc that can move mm -hmm. forward and perhaps help others in other places uh, mm -hmm. whether it be Europe whether it be Africa whether it be uh, the United States with you, with with you know the guys from this and right. I know that at the moment uh, there is this uh, National Justice Party headed by uh, the guys from uh, Mike Enoch, uh, X Striker, yeah, yeah, Striker, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Tony Hovater, mm -hmm. who is the, by the way, Tony Hovater 
is the for everyone listening to he is the uh, the rightful heir of the temple of set so i mean he, he oh. might have the <laughs> no, no. Nice. i always say that to tony <laughs> he knows he knows the joke he knows he knows the joke it's because oh. of the ivory but anyways <laughs> uh so yes and that's the idea no because uh i don't know if you have guys if you guys have seen have watched this uh, documentary by, uh, which is called europeans by oswell mosley mm, i'm i'm familiar with a lot of his speeches and i i sympathize very strongly with him but I'll, i don't know what is the name again of the the documentary Euro europeans okay we'll look it up yeah because in it's like a collection of it's it's of course done about uh, Oswald Mosley. It's not from Oswald from or by Oswald Mosley. It's it's about him. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a tribute uh, for him. It's like one hour. Okay. Yeah. Would it be on BitChute or where might I find it? No, it's on YouTube still. Oh, okay. great. Okay. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in in one of those uh, of those speeches. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am going to turn on my notifications. Give me a second, please. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I sympathize a lot with Oswald Mosley. I think he, for me personally, I, I guess because I'm in the Anglosphere, you know, that's the guy that I kind of look to, you know, as a leader. And so this is certainly something I, I need to get on my radar. Yeah, so what I was saying about mostly is that mostly said, you know, uh, this uh, he 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 saw that the, this uh, battle for the for nationalism during the during the twenties and during the twenties, the thirties, and the forties mm -hmm. as a battle for the European spirit. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, I am not against uniting with others yeah. because we need we need comrades, we need friends. And he said, the next thing. Uh, if we manage to, uh, you know, get, get get gather together, get together, and also try try to awake others, and if we manage to awake others in other parts of uh, other civilizations, other continents, mm -hmm. we might be able to 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 meet. Yeah, he said we might be able to meet the dark forces all together. So that's brilliant, brilliant. So Did I'm that... just doing doing what he said in, in this sense but uh i must do a clarification over here despite okay. that i like a lot of uh, figures from the third position and i i used to be uh that's my basis i would say because uh, first you know as a teenager i was into punk music and mm -hmm. thus i was a de facto anarchist you know fuck the uh, system yeah. and everything yeah yeah but then but then uh, growing up i uh, moved into more um not only metal music, but also it started to develop some of some nationalist leanings, uh, national, mm -hmm. nationalist sentiments. So that's where I came into contact with the third position and I just uh, grew up from there. And at the moment, uh, this is no secret for anyone that ha has interacted with me. I always mention this because I don't want to be, I don't want to be any, uh, to be there any sort of uh, misunderstandings. Uh, at the moment, follow the four political theory developed by Alexander Dugin, but uh, the issue is that just like I mentioned, because we are nationalists and ident identitarians and continentalists and everything, it's like we have our own version, which is called crystallism. Okay. Because we are saying that uh, my country, Peru, is a crystal, you know, like a, a wide array of peoples, of ethnicities, of uh, even cultures if you want to be much more like minimalist uh, mm -hmm. try, try to sorry try to expand more right? instead of being a minimalist and saying just it is just peruvian culture now it's peruvian culture it's like the the supra the supra structure of all these other ethnic uh, cultures okay that's and how you know, does, this, <laughs> does i assume this also exists in other South American countries as well, but is this unique to Peru? This this political theory, yes, is thought okay. about Peru by Peruvians for mm -hmm. Peru in this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we also we came 
before we were all uh, fascists or positionists, we all tried to establish some sort of a uh, version of Italian fascism. Then that didn't work. So we tried with national syndicalism. That didn't work either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we had yeah. to find our own path because uh, for Italian fascism, you need the state. But in my, but given that my country is still a, an, a developing country, mm -hmm. we do not have... Uh, there are places where the state the, the state cannot reach, so you will have to first build up the state in order for then for 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 that moment to start doing uh, this uh, this political um, organizing regarding uh, around the the state. No, so that that's yeah. that's a failure that we we found with fascism and. It was a similar situation regarding uh, national syndicalism because uh, many of the syndicates were not doing their, their jobs, so we had to to make take over the syndicates. And but there are other uh, other industries that do not have syndicates, so you have to first build up those. So you see, the, 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 there was this lot of contradictions. So mm -hmm. we decided to move forward with for political theory because in in then you you recognize that there are many other forms of Political, political organization that are not necessarily uh, the classic ones, just like the syndicates, mm -hmm. just like uh, uh, city councils, so, so far, stuff like that, because we have uh, places uh, places where you where you have like tribal unities, like like a tribal yeah. uh, sure, sure. Tribal head yeah. council on the mm -hmm. on, and sometimes you you have in, in other places where the state does not reach, but they are not uh, an ethnic group, you have like a, a, I would say like neighborhood, neighbor, yeah, neighbor organizations, yeah, organizations uh, built up by neighbors, but yeah, and these neighbors and are the ones that are going, trying to manage and administer all the different things that they are asking for the state and stuff like that. So it's like, it's it's like a very unique situation. So we had to move around and work around that, and we found that within the the framework of the of the four political theory, we had the best option to to move forward. And so far, so far, so good. I must say. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in this topic of ideology versus identity. So I I tend to think that you know third position is a obviously it's a nationalism but it i feel as if it has to grow organically out of one's national identity so w was this the the challenge that you were facing and then also with the you know different tribes and and ethnic groups how did you overcome that and and find that root that common root <clears throat> so because uh for political theories like an, an eclectic seems mm -hmm. yeah, an eclectic uh an eclectic idea. Okay. You, uh, I see that you guys in the uh, in the manifesto of Imperium Art, you mentioned Boas, you mentioned Levi Strauss, uh, Jack Derrida as well. Yes. So what we did is that uh, we must we must recognize that these guys develop tools in order to subvert uh, a culture and not just a culture, a nation and nation a national spirit. No, mm -hmm. but but. What would happen if you manage to subvert their tools and use them for your own political gain? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So basically, this is not, we are not the ones who invented this, neither was doing. Uh, the one who came, the ones who came about uh, with this idea was the French New Right, when they declared themselves uh, right wing Gramscians. So they take uh, many of the, of uh, Antonio Gramsci's ideas, but they, like, let's say, purify. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that's the correct word, but like, they adopt it for their own, okay. uh, for their own political uh, and political and metapolitical activism. Mm -hmm. So, could you describe what kind of activism that you're involved in? What what things are you doing with your content? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, regarding this, uh, we use th these tools uh, to find the key components of what what is a Peruvian, no? what's what makes a Peruvian identity. Okay. So then, once we uh, establish what what that was, uh, we uh, decided to move forward and start doing uh, 
in in this case, I do a political um, show on political theory, which is called El Cholocast, and it's done by in Spanish, of course, and it's done by me, but also by uh, a, two other co-hosts. Co-hosts. One mm -hmm. is from Mexico, and the other one is from Puerto Rico. So nice. we are, we are trying to establish that uh, we want to have a conversation with the entire continent, Great. but we all have our perspectives. So it's like that's how we uh, manage to balance one another organically. For example, uh, my co-host from uh, from Mexico is like an, an atheist. Mm. Uh, the the guy from Puerto Rico is a hardcore uh, Catholic. Yeah. 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 Actually, is there any presence of third position ideology in Puerto Rico? Or yes. How strong is it? There is, because uh, I'd like I'd like to get in touch with people there about that. Yeah, there used to be. Yeah, I can keep I can put in touch put you in touch with uh, my co-host. He yeah. he grew up in the states, so I mean he can speak what's English. His what, what's his name? Ah, uh, you will find him. You will find him on Twitter as Leon de Puertorro. Okay. All right. You can after the show. You can get sent, get me. Connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so uh, what I was saying. Yes, uh, this is part of what I do. But I am also this month uh, because of the pandemic. I also lost my job, and so I had it. Oh, I had econo economic. Uh, yeah, I was uh, in you know, but in a bad economic uh, situation. Wow. Uh, so. But I managed to survive doing this and that, this and that, <laughs> like uh, trying, trying to to try everything, uh, yeah. not just in order to survive. So okay. that's also why I decided to go back to my my, my parents' house. Yeah, and also because so over here it's like it's not uncommon to 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 not leave your parents' house. It's like mm -hmm. how to say this? It's like uh, you have uh, neighborhoods that are really tight in one together. For example, my my neighbor literally lives next door. It's like uh, my building. Uh, mm. It's like next to, like literally. Uh, I understand. How, how I to understand. Say it. Yeah, you you might have seen these uh, pictures mm. of these colorful neighborhoods uh, from South America. I, I would almost, I, I would almost argue that the stigma of sort of moving away from your family, in some sense, is kind of like a globalist sense of like breaking up the family you know like families for ages have lived together you know my my father grew up with his aunts and uncles in in one house you know kind of a irish coal mining town and you know all, everybody was so tight the communities were families they were extended families so i don't you know i don't look down at that at all i think it's a, a strong thing to stay close to your family mm -hmm. Yeah, also that that's what I was getting at because uh, over here, if you still live with your family, all the on, the only thing that you need to do is build up another uh, floor. Okay, oh, and, nice. And you basically become independent, but not really. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so it's like uh, all the, for example, all the uh, let's say the 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 energy is yeah the energy uh, the energy expense is shared mm -hmm. along. All of you so it's that's also how you can sort of a uh, you get bet you get the better economically speaking i get it no that makes sense as well right so i wanted to ask you about your role at the revolutionary conservative website how did you get connected with that position so if you could tell us more about the site and it's you know what what it what it's about and what your role is there mm -hmm. yeah so first uh, what happened was that uh I believe it was during the uh, Augustus uh, Invictus campaign during uh, last year. I believe yes. uh, I, don't, I don't know when exactly was that, but he was asking for uh, people who could write for his site, and I told him, you know, I can translate many articles that I have seen that are very interesting uh, for you guys that might might, might be uh, of sure. interest. Indeed. So that's uh, yeah. I talked to him, and he said, you know, okay. Uh, he gave me permissions to publish, and he never uh, said, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't publish this. Of course, uh, I know about the the uh, the American laws that can get uh, Augustus into uh, 
it's a problem, you know, like, uh, for example, no fed posting, no, no uh, calling up for violence, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, of course, that's out of the picture. Yeah, but but that, that's also common sense. <laughs> I mean, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, but at the same time, the uh, one of the articles, you, of course, you didn't write this article, you translated it, but it is the Tempest Ist Manifesto. I'm, I'm sure in, in Spanish, uh, Tempest IST, Tempest Ist, which is, sounds right. In English, that's a tough word. To, to, it doesn't roll off the tongue very well, but it's a, a wonderful kind of uh, third position art manifesto. Uh, that's, I, I guess, El Facha. Uh, I'm going to br brutalize this. El Fach Facho cast from Mexico. And yes. Do you, know, do you know what I'm, did I pronounce that correctly? Facho cast? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, that is, it's, I believe it's based off the Italian futurist manifesto and it's extremely bombastic, right? And maybe yes. more so. I would say that the Mexicans outdid the Italians in this case for uh, being, you know. So, from an art manifesto perspective, it's extremely bold. It's basically the idea that we celebrate the destruction of the old way. Uh, and and it's it's quite violent in the way that they describe it. But anybody who understands art manifestos and futurism and these kinds of things, it's not literal. I, I you know you're you're not actually using the blood of your enemies to paint canvases or something of that nature. You know, um, but it's extremely uh, inspiring. It's it's got a very militaristic tone and. It, it reads almost like poetry in in the in this kind of like uh, the poetry of chaos, the poetry of war per se. Um, and I'm, I'm I'd like to read a little bit of it at some point here, but I, I don't want to interrupt you. I'd like to learn a little bit more about you know what you're doing with the revolutionary conservative site. Yes, um, regarding that, uh, I found that uh, like Americans have a problem with their I don't, I don't know if it was like the av availability of books at the moment uh, mm -hmm. when I joined the, the Revolutionary Conservative because right now I have seen uh, Until of uh, Until of Hill publishing uh, for the first time published uh, Leon de Grel's book in English because I I remember I recall that I did the like an amateur translation of that so that's that inspired uh, a more uh, professional translation of the book mm -hmm. so it's like Right now we are all keeping uh, keeping keeping the, this a similar pace okay Be before mm -hmm. that you know it was very complicated for me to try to to explain someone uh these conceptions like for example uh, leon de grel talks about in his book he talks about the revolution of the spirit you know that mm -hmm. i i said that to anyone to, to someone else it's like uh, the, I don't know. I don't understand that. Is, is that Ebola? <laughs> so it's <Yeah>. like, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there is like a means translation because we lack the concept. We lack the uh, the proper uh, uh, how to say this? The, the, the proper uh, bibliography. But uh, right now that that's that's changing. You know? So I said, you know, I perhaps I can also help with this, but. Uh, you know, translating books takes a lot of time, so it's oh, like yeah. perhaps I should do something else, like uh, give people something uh, much more shorter in shorter time spans to read. So that's why I decided to start translating articles from Spanish to English, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sometimes from Italian to English, sometimes from French to English too. Uh, wow, impressive. Or Portuguese to English. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so getting to know you a little bit more and, and, and your position within the, the white positive sphere or the dissident right, one of the main questions here that we have for you is what should people in the greater European diaspora, specifically North America, uh, Europe, what should we know about the dissident right in Central and South America? You know, what, where are we missing out or what, what do we not understand about our brothers and sisters down there? And this is the main difference you already mentioned. Mm. This is right. You know, there is no this is right. <laughs> I mean, you you mm. begin explicitly as third position, nationalist, mm. like that, 
and then either you start moving forward with that. But uh, example here, right wing means conservative. Uh, what's the other thing? Uh, you know, this Christian Christian right, just mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. big, and also li classical liberals, which are basically the conservatives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Nullis actually had a question on the same topic. Nullis, did you want to pop in here? Hi, yeah, I, I actually had, maybe for the audience sake and also for my edification purposes, maybe I'd like to start with one question here to help explain um, what what does it mean, at least, you see, because from our perspective, and maybe I should introduce this question a little bit, uh, I fully agree with you that each nation has its own organic reality in how it perceives itself in terms of its nationalism. Um, I, I don't really believe that there's one unified uh, uh, conception of national nationalism. Um, you can't uh, sort of uh, transfer the American context, or even the even within Europe. You know, many nations have different understandings of their experience and history. So, in South America, obviously, you're going to have differences of uh, interpretation. Now, by with saying that, um, so the question is, what does it mean to be white in South America? And the reason I'm asking this is because many times you'll see like these very complicated um, like charts that'll show if it's this Castizo or Mestizo or Carillo, or Carillo I mean, and, I, and again, I'm not uh, probably butchering these, <laughs> these terms, but it gets very, it gets very complex. And so, so um, my question is, is there, is it a social distinction in, in South America? Is it a cultural distinction? Or is it a an outright racial distinction? So how does that contrast to the Europe, uh, the U.S. and Europe? We mean, what does it mean to be white? So basically, yeah, down here it's like really simple to see someone if someone is white or if someone is black, and we are not uh, saying uh, no, no, that because you identify as such, you are such. So it's like this is not the case here. It's like. We very boldly and very accurately describe one another and we also have racial jokes between one another most of this will get you into trouble in the united states yeah so it's like if you're white we have jokes for whites if you're black we have jokes for blacks if you're an indio we have jo uh, jo uh, jokes for amerindians but the the thing is this is that uh, we also have our own sense of humor mm. for example in I see. I see that in the United States. I don't. I don't know why this is, but uh, in, in the sense of your more irony is, is designed for the other person that you are mocking to feel bad. Where mm. here is not that's not the case. It's like it's not. I am. I am laughing at you. It's like I am laughing with you. Mm -hmm. So it's like I make a joke, but I also, you know, make it in in a way that I you 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 laugh you yeah. laugh at. At the joke and you laugh with me you know and say yeah you're an asshole no? <laughs> so it's, it's all just rice and beans then yeah rice is just like another no rice and beans i'm sorry my joke totally failed <laughs> um <laughs> i know in, in my friends in puerto rico say that you know it's just rice and beans meaning black and white all mixed together it's a kind of how it's like a sort of a, a playful joke they use about race no oh, i mean okay. the the reason the reason I'm asking is because, as far as I understand it, historically at least, um, there was a you know a caste system in South yeah, America they... that defined that defined who was European, who was not European, what level of mixture there was between. So so there was an awareness of what it meant to be a European in in South America, and there was a distinction between uh, on on different let's say social class system. Um, in, in terms of what it meant to be a European. And, and I think that the question I'm asking is that, is this still kind of a, uh, uh, an undertone in, in, in South America? Does it make any kind of a difference in terms of uh, where one stands within the nation? No, that's the, the, only, the only case where this is, uh, this is a reality is with, when you deal, yeah, when in politics you deal with people that are following an ideology called uh, indigenism mm. it's like okay. you are pushing for the just like you you see in the united states decolonization you know it's yeah. 
you know, why this is the problem and all that stuff. But uh, even that's really, uh, at least in my country, it's not as big as it once was. There was mm -hmm. a time where that was really big and that it, it, it was uh, ethnic. There were ethnic tensions between Amerindians and whites and, you know, so mestizos were like in the crossfire, you know, you either you stand with them or you stand with us, just yeah. like we see right now in the in the United States with Black Lives Matter. So there was a similar situation, but uh, given that at the moment we have all uh, gotten through a lot of a lot of really uh, really uh, grave moments, not great, but grave. Like, no, I, uh, and I, I can appreciate that because I'm thinking in particular uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, for example, who um, had this yes. kind of an indigenous uh, policy um, and again, you know, one can argue that there are socioeconomic implications there. Um, and again, you know, or in, if you go to Argentina, where the population is also somewhat mixed, but less mixed and more European than, for example, other parts mm -hmm. of South America. And then again, Brazil is a completely different uh, uh, sphere altogether. Um, so, so I find it very fascinating and and interesting because. You know, if you look at, and again, I'm looking at this from an external um, layman's position, so please correct me I, at any time. But a lot of times what you'll see is um, prominent politicians in South America being basically Europeans, and in many cases at least, um, traditionally, and, and the elite in, in South America being of European descent for the most part. Or if you look at these telenovelas in the television, most of them are very Spanish appearing, very European appearing. So, so it just it just gives me that impression that there is a component there somewhere buried in there, uh, maybe subconsciously or something, where where there is a distinction, but the distinction is defined somewhat differently than in the United States, for example, where you would have a very clear line between what it means, for example, in the United States to be white and black, for example. Um, so that's that's really what I'm finding very fascinating. And again, I'm not I'm not an expert by any means in in, uh, in South America, but I, I do find it very interesting. Yeah, it's really simple to explain because uh, they they are the descendants of the ones uh, who once ruled uh, some of them. But the issue is that uh, at some point that used to be a a closed a closed club. So it's like you, mm -hmm. they, they, they like the club preserves their the the right for anyone to join it's like not not anyone can join even if you are a European migrant descendant and you manage to live to live yeah yeah you manage to build up a, a really good enterprise and whatever if they are not interested in having you on board with the inside of the little their little club they are not going to uh, to let you in it's it's as simple as that now, it's very it's very interesting by the way I'm sorry to interrupt you because I have some friends that are of Hungarian descent that are from South America. And I've heard this exact complaint from them saying that even though they're Europeans that migrated or, or fled uh, through, you know, after 1945 and 1956, many fled down to uh, South America. I've heard complaints that, you know, there's, there's a, an elite there that even makes a distinction between them and European migrants and immigrants that came in. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, at least in my country, that has changed over the years because they uh, managed to find that um, at the moment they are not very popular, so they start to incorporate other people, for example. In my country, it's, it was very easy to see, uh, you know, Fujimori got, got into uh, into the politics, became our president. Mm -hmm. Now, we to explain this is also because we have a... Uh, a lot of uh, we had a lot of uh, Japanese uh, immigration back then. Quite, quite fascinating, so, actually. Yeah. 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 So it's it's like not uncommon for anyone to know a, a guy that is at at least one friend of you of yours is is definitely Japanese. You Interesting. Know? There are a lot there are a lot of jokes <laughs> for Japanese <Yeah>. people. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I I lived in Japan for a year and worked for a Japanese corporation for two years in New York City. So when I found out about that in Peru, I was I was <laughs> thought, wow, fascinating. But that's a whole other topic. Uh, right. But what's, what's quite interesting though is is the just an incredible amount of diversity in mm -hmm. Peru and of course all of Central America. But um, 
Yeah, I guess I'm trying to bring this back to the theme of the show a little bit. It's important for us to understand your perspective, your conditions. Right. What are the parallels with, you know, Europe and America, Canada, etc.? And I, this is all coming together really clearly. So it's it's very helpful. I'm, there was another question about third position, though, if, if there's a kind of a stigma in in Peru or South America as the, as there is in in the United States for example no not really there is no okay. there is no stigma so but we uh, could have an open discussion i could simply ask uh, uh, i know people from chile puerto rico uh, these different places and uh, just how would i open up a conversation about third position with them just are you a nationalist yeah, well, like, buy them a beer, you know. And then... <laughs> they start off with alcohol, right? Yeah. Okay. And then just ask uh, the question, no? perhaps yeah. ask uh, about the situation in the country. Then uh, what are your what are your thoughts about this? And then uh, start asking, no, uh, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps uh, what what are your your politics more leaning towards too? And sometimes you even you even find people that say, you know, oh, I like what the the National Socialists did in Germany, you know, but uh, sure. but then again, you know, six million, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, this, despite that, you know, you you can have an honest conversation with someone regarding all these topics. Yeah. The problem was that um, we only had once a third position party that was really weak and tried to uh, bring together the entire country. This was the Acción de the Unión Revolucionaria, the Revolutionary Union back in the 30s. Wow. And they tried to copy the uh, Italian model, but uh, they, they also added the ethnic component. And that's the, the time span when we started to have a lot of uh, Japanese and Chinese, and sometimes you're talking, you're talking a uh, Vietnamese uh, migrant. Yes. So uh, the country tried he, the the yeah the, the leadership of the party tried to be, bring everyone together against against them. So we basically because they they didn't integrate. So we it was like a, a bullying campaign. We bullied them into integration. Wow. And that that's why that's why they they are the they are the way they are in in my country. And it's like an anomaly compared to other countries because. Yeah. I think it, the only place where they they are like in a similar situation, but not really, would be uh, in Brazil, in uh, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo has a lot of Japanese uh, descendants too. Mm -hmm. So, so what my, they, I, I just yeah, yeah. And real fast here, I, <laughs> I I lived in Asia for five years, had a huge background in in Chinese studies, etc. But my thinking is that we nationalists can connect with East Asians on anti-communism, on anti-Marxism, that you know, a lot of them are, you know, Vietnam, China, they're fleeing from communist regimes, oppression of that kind. And also they're very conservative people by nature. They are very different from us, right, in terms of culture, ethnicity, religion. However, they're very much the same as us in their conservative family values and anti-communism. So I would, that's just my personal two cents on the issue. I said, you know, maybe that's a kind of advice that people in Peru could consider, you know, to connect, uh, have better relations with the Asians there. No, we have uh, good relations with them, with all of them. I mean, that happened during the thirties. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. That's, that's not the case anymore. Right? And it's like, it's normal for you to, even for me, you know, to to have at least dated once uh, uh, an Asian-looking chick. Mm. So it's it's like, it's like it's not uncommon anymore. Oh, yeah. it, it used to be. Uh, I think that everything changed when the when there was uh, this uh, communist uprising during the seventies and eighties yeah. and early nineties, because it's like. They are going to kill you either either way, you know. <laughs> they they don't they didn't give a shit to to kill. Uh, there was this uh, a black uh, female uh, political organizer and also syndicalist called Marielena Moyano, mm -hmm. and these guys 
killed, kidnap her, kill her, and then dynamited her body. Okay. Just, just to make a, just to make a point. Wow. But, but that's that's the issue, you know. They managed to uh, bind us together, you know, against them because the other thing is that they also uh, gentrified the left, or more like uh, created a big schism within the left because for them, for the shining path of Peru from the eighties. Uh, from the 70s, 80s, uh, they started to say, like, uh, you know, the, the Cubans, you know, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, all those guys are bourgeoisie. You know, we do not have anything in common with them. If, if you re reivindicate them, you be, uh, if you are parroting the, the talking points, you are an enemy of ours. So it's like they managed to be uh, this really, really fr uh, fringe group that, um, I don't know, that managed to uh, grow as a, grow, yeah, grow in, in members as a, um, personality cult to to the leader and yeah. what's funny is that the or what's tragic that is that the lead, this leader was just uh, you know he he didn't he, he was just a bachelor he, he didn't he never he never uh, finished uh, finished uh, going forward with his studies mm -hmm. uh, never wrote anything outside of uh, of his uh, bachelor of his bachelor thesis which was yeah. uh, a thesis regarding uh, Kant and space mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that just it. And I don't know. I, I many of us still cannot understand how did he became so popular. And many started to figure out that perhaps it was because the guy was an uh, an anthropology and history teacher. So it's like mm -hmm. he can he can make up a lot of he he can twist a lot of minds with with just that you know because of the access that he right. has to uh, to young right. minds. I think that all forms of communism, Marxism, Maoism, socialism, whatever it, whatever mask it goes under, there's always some kind of psychological manipulation at play. And so, yeah, there's that, you know, cult of personality, weaponizing the lower classes or people that are socially uh, kind of outcast in various ways. But um, you know, also twisting, twisting their history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get into the art discussion here. It, it's uh, we, honestly we could go on and on talking about all this history. That's it's really really important information. But I would like to try to turn the direction more towards art and start off with just your personal aesthetics and your standards for art. What kind of artwork do you like, and do you think qualifies as good art and bad art in your opinion? Yeah, and this is uh, one of the main things. It's like because uh, the way to understand my country and the way to understand South America for everyone, mm -hmm. it's uh, really simple. It's a paradox. Mm. I mean, under normal conditions, it will be destroyed, you know, immediately. If, if we were Africa, we will we will not exist anymore. Mm. Uh, but we but we aren't. Uh, and and Peru is. A paradox inside of this paradox so it's that's that's why it's really wow. complicated to, wow. to explain my country and such but uh just like i said you know and this is the other reason why it was really complicated to have uh to have a nationalism that it's going to bind all, everyone together you know they the, the two times that this happened was because they had an, an outside enemy or mm -hmm. yeah we, we can argue that the, these communists were also outsiders because they didn't recognize the republic as valid so you know it, it's it's true now regarding that uh, what i say what i need to say about the art is that we are also very uh, very varied very yeah we, very i don't want to use the word diverse but uh let's say we have many different uh, artistic currents that came in with the with the different mig mi migrations with the different uh, also generations, many of them also dis decided to develop their own uh, artistic sense. We with, with also with with the uh, what's it? Yeah, yeah, yes. With with the, with the advent of the tele of the TV in TV, yeah. with the, we were also shown many different many different uh, things, uh, many different programs. So it's like. Uh, for for example, in my country, I know that you guys in the United States grew up, uh, you know, watching perhaps cartoons, perhaps, uh, you know, um, comics, all this kind oh, of yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, over here is like 
everyone has watched anime. So it's, it's like part of our childhood. All yeah, right. Um, so, and that's an example. Uh, we also have watched cartoons too. So it's, it's, it's like you have many different things going on at the same time. So what's, what develops your own uh, uh, as, as, yes, aesthetic sense, it's like all of this information, all of these things that you are starting to process and to, to find your mm -hmm. own place regarding that. Uh, for example, I am um, like, uh, as, as you have seen with the interaction that we had today, you know, with music, uh, I like a lot of this uh, very retro uh, 80s, 70s kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also was uh, was into thrash metal for for my lot of part of my youth. So it's like a lot of a lot of this greasy, uh, very uh, <laughs> I get you know, it. very like uh, in the I would say city city kind of kind of aesthetic. Like like uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like but, an urban uh, aesthetic is what you're saying. Like what? urban like a uh, city yeah, yeah. yeah something like urban aesthetic okay so it's, that's kind of my, my much more on my thing but uh, regarding other other stuff uh, because of the many influences that, that i really have i like i like the guy the the work that that you guys are doing with with that also with the uh, with the comic that you guys are doing oh uh, thank you yeah, there, I mean, I'm doing, uh, I'm working with Mark Brahm and I've done things with him. I've got my own uh, comics on AmericanZarathustra.com. We uh, interviewed an indie comics guy, Dillard Q. Thurman, who I strongly mm. recommend everybody check out his work. He's uh, really, it, it's just something sp special. And, and then, of course, we've got our, you know, people like Stone Toss or, you know, other people out there that, and then, of course, we're involved with the white art collective and there's very many great visual artists and musicians there so it's it's a wonderful world that we're we're in right now there's it's very diverse in terms of styles aesthetics etc but it's all bonded together on theme and purpose you know and understanding on you know white replacement strategies and globalism and, and all these other issues that we're facing so um, I guess there's a, it, it's, I've always thought like heavy metal is king in South America. <laughs> it just seems like so many people like it down there. I wonder why that is exactly, you know, like, you know, I, I know there's my friends in Puerto Rico, that there's a scene where they like indie rock, like kind of American style indie rock, uh, alternative rock. Um, but it just doesn't really seem to take as well as the heavier stuff. Or of course your own music, but that's different different topic mm -hmm. so, so yeah we were kind of looking for your views on imperium art then you know what what uh, we're very grateful that you've been following the show you Indeed. know I was so impressed to see that you've been liking and sharing and that means a lot to me to have people of your stature recognize the work that we're doing so i wanted to kind of first off get your general take of what we're doing what is imperium art to you and do you have any comments or criticisms about it so far? Uh, I, I, I have like more than criticism, like an advice, because it, this is something that I have noticed uh, down here. It's like uh, this is, and this is also a problem with within the third position cir uh, circles. Okay, is that when they get too much into the Imperium and uh, kind of trying to uh, reform this idea of. Uh, the empire, like going back to the Roman Empire and mm -hmm. like that, or the Byzantian Empire, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they start they start to get more, more and more into church, into this. When when they say about when they talk about tradition, they are not talking about paganism. For example, they talk, they say just no, just uh, this form of Christianity is my own. It's just my own tradition, because uh, it was popular within the Rom with the Romans and thus you know this or the, with the Byzantine Empire, you know, and that's that's a problem that I see. And I also have like my own, uh, given that I have a lot of different uh, aesthetic influences. Like mm -hmm. If I could res res uh, summarize, mine would be like uh, this kind of urban, but also uh, because I like Imperium, I like all this kind of stuff. Mm. Or like, like, your like your futurist retro kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know how to explain this, but uh, have you ever played 
Have you ever played the uh, Mega Man X? Well, uh, uh, Archeo Futurism is I uh, can I I think the style that you're referring to it's it's a uh, sort of the futuristic look at the past in a way you have uh, Photoshop is probably the the number one tool of of the dissident right in in terms of making these kinds of images just to you know taking classical sculptures and putting them through filters uh collaging them with scenes of say world war ii or and there's very many in, very impressive artists out there uh we could go on a, a tangent about that but you were referring to a, a certain video game just now what, what was it called yeah may i'm an ex for example uh the things that i like would be like uh, if you google neo arcadia something like that okay. but like with more uh but like with more uh, vegetation, <laughs> that would be my, my, the only thing that I would add because I, I am also kind of like, I like stuff uh, but from the deep ecologists, uh, oh. from Linkola, from uh, Kaczynski, you know, even, even then I have a lot of uh, different influences and I have my criticisms of them as well. But uh, I agree, I tend to find a middle, try to find a middle point with, with that. So it's like very technological, but at the same time, not that not as much because we kind of try to recognize uh, the value of nature and the things that nature possess that cannot be repli replicated. Sure. Um, if I can, if I can quickly interject, I think this is a phenomenal and a very in important point that you're bringing up, Zero. Um, what what maybe we haven't really contextualized properly in the Imperium Art uh, project so far is how do we express this uh, transition from the traditional to the future in in a in a tangible sense? I think that that I think and correct me if I'm I'm mistaking, but I think that's really what you're referring to. So in other words, um, what you're criticizing is and and justifiably criticizing is that that concept of return to tradition right um which you know personally i you know i have my 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 uh point of departure which you know i've always you know uh um, i've always shared and um i include and incorporate my my faith and my religion and my catholic uh traditions into it but but i think that what you're making here is a very important point that i think needs to be addressed in the imperium art project which is we are not looking to go back in time. We're not looking to create a past that might not have even existed exactly as we're trying to envision it. What we're trying to do, I think, in Imperium Martin, at least that was my hope in, in conveying that message, is we're using those elements in the past. We're using that continuity, the continuity that includes our ancient Greco-Roman tr pagan traditions, um, are the Germanic pagan traditions, the uh, Slavic or the uh, uniquely Hungarian pagan traditions, all of these traditions going into the continuity of Christianity, continuing going forward into the future of, of what we're trying to achieve. And so I think that that um, contextualizing this in, 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 in a tangible form, saying this is how we envision the future, I think that's something that that we haven't really addressed properly yet in in the Imperium Mart project. I mean, uh, are you following me on this? Am I am I sort of missing the point, or is this really what we're no, talking? No, that's about? exactly that's exactly the point. So 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 don't misunderstand me in terms of of understanding. So we we cannot get lost in the past. I think that's a, maybe a good way of putting it. We can't get lost in nostalgia. And we can't get lost in the in the I don't want to say it this way because I don't believe it's a fantasy, but we can't get lost in the fantasy of something that we cannot recreate. I think what we need to do is we need to we need to draw upon this as a source of inspiration, as a source of power, if you will, to create something new. Now I, for one, have always been an advocate of, of, you know, recapturing our institutions. And what I mean by that is, you know, these all belong to us, all of these different institutions that are in, in the, um, let's call it the European sphere, um, for lack of a better term, or the European diaspora. And I think that that it's it is, should be a goal to recapture these, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we then hold on to it and, and you know, not 
evolve from it. So this is the big challenge because we have so many different points of view in the Imperium. If you want to, let's use the word Imperium in this case. There's so many different points of view, so many different positions. And, and I hope that we can all draw inspiration from each other, learn from each other, and find the consensus going forward that gives us that power to contextualize a future in a tangible format. I hope that made sense, guys. <laughs> that was beautifully said, by the way. Absolutely. And also, I need to add to what you were saying. Uh, you referenced this in your manifesto, in your essay. When you when you reference the uh, the futurists from from Marinetti, for example. Yes. So so, but the, the difference and the distinction with the futurists, and this is also the the, the distinction with the guys from the tempestist, uh, the tempestistas. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it would be like uh, unlike them who want to abolish for a, a better uh, for a lack of a better word. Uh, the different things that existed before and you know move forward with something completely different from 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 scratch from scratch you what you're trying to do is uh, moving forward with the already existing forms but giving them a new shape mm -hmm. is that uh, i'm correct with that i capture what you were saying in i mean if it was uh, part five or part well, six what I, what I was talking about there was actually slightly different um what I was really saying there was the balance of I it's actually it starts in the previous section, which is embracing the full emotional spectrum of so so that the artist should embrace the full emotional spectrum that they possess if they feel anger, if they feel frustration, if they feel uh, um, loss, whatever emotion they feel, an artist must be able to freely embrace the entire emotional spectrum in order to be able to produce uh, a work of art that's honest and genuine. And, but at the same time, and, and, and you need to have a balance. And that balance I try to present through this, uh, um, I, I called it the dialectic of artistic violence. And I meant what I meant by that was that the futurist was an unapologetic um, force of nature, if you will. Um, and, and there was a certain destructive element to that force of nature. Now, what the motivation of that uh, a destructive nature is, is, is you know, is, is an important point. But what I really wanted to capture there was that it was an unapologetic force. It said, we have to do this. But in other words, what I, what I want to say with that is that's, that's an important aspect to embrace. But we need to balance it with a very strong and, 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 and fundamental moral grounding. If we don't have a strong moral foundation, then, then we can get lost in, 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 the, uh, um, in this, quote unquote, in this violence, in this, in this energy, if you will. Uh, so I hope that explained that properly. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Actually, I'm mm -hmm. actually looking at the, uh, the essay right now. The, uh, uh, it sounds much better in Spanish. El, uh, Tempest, Tempest, help me out here, buddy. Tempestists, the uh, Tempestistas, they are talking about this. Uh, they're using a lot of verbiage about violence, and uh, again, I say that it's 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 a passion. It's it's. Uh, so, allegorical. Uh, sorry to interrupt okay. again. Okay. Maybe maybe to add, and I'm sorry, zero. Just to add, maybe yeah. the the element of chaos that that is a part of that 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 energy that that um let's just call it uh, a violent energy that that uh aspect of chaos ultimately creates some new forms and and it, and it builds upon the old in a way but what i'm trying to also say is that i think that you need an element of that chivalric discipline that that chivalric code that gives you a grounding in 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 who you are so you don't get lost in in the uh, other one side of your emotional spectrum, and I'm sorry, I'll just stop here with that. Then. No, completely. You, you know, I agree with you, uh, but that's that's what they are doing. You know, <laughs> but again, yeah. I am not Mexican, so it's 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 up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, speaking about the the the, the this uh, the war, not tempest. Um, I don't know. And we are talking about Europe. Donald, are you, aren't you familiar with the? Uh, with the vocal, yeah, with the vocalist from uh, Europe, from the band from the 80s. What's the name of the band? Europe. 
Oh, the band. Like, I'm sorry. Like yes. Me? Yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, big time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, do you know the the name of the the vocalist from them? No, I don't. I Joey know he's Tempest. Swedish. Yeah. Joey Tempest. Yeah. <laughs> Tempest. Tempest. <laughs> And, Europe. And, and I think, but I think it's important also, and I, maybe I should add a note to this uh, as a qualification, that I do believe in traditional values, and I do believe in preserving traditional values. I do also believe that it's important that we define what these traditional values are. So in other words, if we allow others to define it for us, then we wind up, we wind up in a pseudo tradition. <laughs> And so, so we have to be very careful in, in understanding these things. So when I talk of tradition, I think of it in terms of a continuity. I think of it in terms of an ongoing uh, legacy that belongs to us. That's something that is our responsibility to preserve. But at the same time, you know, we must give it space to evolve and we have to give something, we have to pay it forward to the next generation. But when we're doing this, we have to contextualize it in our on in 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 our context, and not allow others to contextualize. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I sort of yeah, I contextualize it for us, you know. Correct. Yeah, and and I think that that's important. That's a very important thing to uh, take into consideration. I guess the topic of uh, and again, I'm, we're using this as an allegory, uh, artistic violence. It has different manifestations in different mm -hmm. cultures. Uh, you know, I I I think of the movies of Alejandro Jodorowsky in, in Mexico and how insanely violent and disturbing, but also how artistic they are. And, um, you know, I don't know, there's, there's, I suppose different countries have different ways of, of looking at their own histories or of processing death and violence in these things through the arts, right? The Day of the Dead in Mexico, you know. Uh, Europe isn't without its violence. America's not without its violence, but we, we maybe show this or use this in different ways. And here, you know, we're talking about it in, in context of the arts, using the arts as a, I guess, a weapon of change, uh, cultural change, ideological change, spiritual change. And so that's just kind of putting a, a bigger umbrella over this whole discussion, you know, just to kind of cap that a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm very much aligned with what Nullis is saying. I'm just trying to see what's different in terms of our right. perception of Imperium art and Zero's perception of Imperium art from yep. that, that sense. Um, is there anything more you wanted to, to say about that, Zero? Yes, uh, you know, that's, that being said, you know, with the with this uh, advice that I tried to give you, for example, mm -hmm. you can also watch and or see another other sorts, other sorts of uh, all sorts of, uh, how to say this, so more like their own versions or implementations regarding that. For example, uh, I, I have friends that are like really, really, really the, the big into these uh, Bachman movies, like, you know, Marvel movies and DC yeah, yeah. movies and sure. stuff. So because I want to hang out with my friends, I have to watch those movies. But uh, <laughs> what caught my eye uh, in two of these movies, one was uh, Black Panther. It's like mm -hmm. they they also incorporated the concept of archaeofuturism, but without real without realizing yeah, because yeah, yeah. all of these guys in Africa were doing their own tribes and says whatever. But ethno nationalism, technology, technology did, did not surpass them. Did not surpass their their traditions of the culture. Mm -hmm. in, instead, they managed to uh, mold technology to what they were already doing, and this is. I believe this is part of the step moving forward with uh, mm. this idea of archaeofuturism because uh, okay. there are other critics. There are other critics of of, te of technology, not not just Kaczynski, for example. Uh, we have Junger, uh, Ernst Junger, uh, the German um, war hero. He wrote in this is in this essay uh, on pain. That's the name of the essay. Okay. He, wrote, he writes about the, you know, this skepticism, this skepticism that he has okay. regarding technology, regarding, uh, you know, how technology is dehumanizing the human and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah. And by doing this, by uh, what the, you know, in this uh, work of fiction, you know, what the Wakandans did, technology was a part of their, um, of their society, but it wasn't everything. 
So this is the, the difference. This is the counterpoint to yeah. other, other stuff like transhumanism, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. If I can rephrase what you're saying or, or just reflect it back to you, what I'm hearing is that art and technology should grow from our indigenous spirit, our, our cultural ways, and it be an extension of our nationalism rather than change us into something else. Now, the, the use of transhumanism is, to my knowledge, from my research, is, is uh, meant to change us into, uh, how do I say, more docile, uh, inhuman creatures that is that are easier to rule over from the top and we know who who we're talking about here without saying so that's that's kind of that's evil that's pure evil and disturbing and terrifying but the the singularity or the the changes that are coming i don't know if they're stoppable so there's this question uh jason reza, reza georgiani talks about with uh, prometheanism as he calls it the idea of getting taking this technology and making it work for us in some way uh and we're talking about things like you know uh, designer genes and and human technology interfaces and these kinds of things but in such a way and i i don't personally embrace that because i that kind of it just is too big and too terrifying and such a change from what we already are organically but it, it's a very important and huge discussion and maybe i would love to have jason on the show by the way but um i don't know i it's that's kind of what i'm hearing from you and i'm wondering if if we can take this advice of yours to you know kind of draw our inspiration from our what we call the western bio spirit you know our, or what i would call our indigenous european spirit per se and and make the art come from there and that that somehow should be crafted as as nationalism in accordingly right every, every country is going to have its own form of national like like we all have our own flags for example right um our own languages yeah. you know so and this could then in a more profound and deeper way bring north america europe together with other nationalist countries in say south america for example so th this is a I, 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 every show we have i always look for a gold nugget you know a, a takeaway that i'm i'm trying to dig out of the guest you know i don't know if that's the right analogy but i'm trying to elicit some gold thread from uh, the brilliant people that we have on the show and so i, I deeply appreciate your advice on this so i guess the, the next yes. Oh, sorry. Did you want to comment or should we move on? I actually, I'm sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Zero. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say regarding, you know, transhumanism and all this kind of stuff is like, of course, this is what uh, not, not just Junger. There are many others uh, like Heidegger talks about this, uh, mm -hmm. how technology is going to uh, lead to the destruction of the human, you know, the, yeah. what he calls the being, being mm -hmm. insofar as being. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also need to be uh, like, like you. Let's say you are dealing with a radi radioactive ma radioactive material. Okay. So it's like extremely precise, extremely careful, and all that. But uh, in another in another sense, when we talk about uh, archaeofuturism, I don't know if you're familiar. You know, given that we have all we have been uh, interacting. Uh, on Twitter, you know, uh, sending music like, for example, Deep Purple. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and these other bands. Yeah. For example, trans, uh, sorry, uh, archaeofuturism has already happened in music. I don't know if you are familiar with the, with Inbi Malsim from Sweden. Uh, say the name one more time. Inbi Malsim. Oh, Ingwe Malsim. Yes, of course I know. Yeah. He's, uh, he kind of combines classical with like hard rock guitar is known as like a guitar wizard, basically. Yeah, basically. And and this is not just, uh, just like you said, you know, this resonates more with the, the European bio spirit. You know, nice. perhaps that's, that's the reason why when I was uh, in Spain walking on the streets, I was listening to this kind of stuff. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it, now it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I get it now, right, in context. Yeah. 
I mm -hmm. actually, I have an interesting uh, question. I don't know really as much as how it's related. It's not really related to transhumanism and, and technology so as much as it is. Um, what I notice is that there's a burgeoning sense of civilizational destiny uh, in different parts of the world. Um, if you look at China, you know, China looks at the Han Chinese look at themselves as as a, a cohesive nation, culture and race that have a collective destiny. Um, in India, they're speaking about a an Indian destiny, a civilizational destiny. Now, you know, we can break down the Chinese into many different ethnicities, the Indians into many different ethnicities, but they're talking about a collective um, civilizational uh, purpose, a goal, uh, a, a view of the future for themselves. And what I notice is that, sadly, the Western uh, uh, concept of this is, is being muddled through many different uh, manipulations and subversions. So, so that's one of the reasons why we're trying to put perspective on this through Imperium Art, among other things, um, and, and many other excellent uh, efforts uh, in this regard. How would you consider, let's say, South America? Would would you say South America is defining its own civilizational destiny, or would you say that they are a part of the greater European uh, imperium in the sense that the greater European biospirit, the greater European destiny, or is it something distinct and separate? Yeah, uh, this is something that I yeah wanted to comment on because uh, when I was in Spain, you know, yeah, I was listening to him massive and felt like it makes sense. But uh, when I was just walking on the streets, I, I it's like I fell at home. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know how to how to explain it. Beautiful. And of course, I am obviously a mixed person, just like many others uh, around the Peruvian coast. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I felt the same way when I was uh, visiting Machu Picchu. Like, mm -hmm. huh. like eight years ago, it's like I felt this. I felt the same way. It's like mm. a breath, like breathtaking. Yeah, like a breath, uh, breathtaking experience. Yes. But like, it's like, it's like feeling wondered or yeah, mm -hmm. feel, feel feeling amazed by mm -hmm. something like part of me resonated more with that. It's like I am part of that history and I did that, and I felt the same way when walking in Spain. Oh, uh, and what I must say is that uh, I just I did not just visit Spain. I visited many other countries like Hungary, uh, Austria, Germany, all of those places. Yeah, and, and I didn't like I didn't connect uh, with those places, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like something that resonates with you, and I don't know how to how to explain this. And so I I think you know, um, but this is my own experience. But I think that. Uh, Many uh, many people in South America would do the same regarding, for example, the Brazilians can go to Portugal, yeah. and in Portugal they can um, have the same the same experience just as I, as I did, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, in this sense, we are always going to have uh, part of our motherboard, so to speak. Just, just <laughs> right now that, that we are speaking about the technology and all that, so I am going to use that. Yeah. Okay. Part of our board, our motherboard. It's going to come from Europe, definitely, uh, depending on, on who you are, you know, what's your ascendance, uh, yeah. you're descendant from, you will connect with uh, one of the old world uh, uh, countries much more than with the others. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at the same time, we are also doing our own thing. We also want to project our own vision of the world, our own, uh, just like you mentioned, civilizational destiny, civilizational fate. Yeah. So in so in this sense, I is, I think that we are we are our own, but we will always have this part of us that is that comes from Europe and cannot be denied. In, yes. in fact, the people that deny this are the ones that are holding us back. Because when when we say that, for example, in my specific case, which is Peru, uh, Peru comes from the the clash, but also the unity of two empires. Which one on one side you have the Inca Empire. And on the other side, you have the Spanish Empire. So, mm -hmm. thus, you know, it's not really, you know, for the chess or, you know, mm -hmm. or, is, or you know, or um, how to say this, uh, phys physical, or, yeah, thermodynamics or anything to say, you know, if, if this is 
the two places that I come from, perhaps this is also part of my destiny, you know, to continue this this line, this line of thought, you know. Mm -hmm. So, it's, but by doing so, you know, by whether it be the over here, there are there is also another uh, cultural uh, movement which is the Hispanism, which says mm -hmm. that we we are just part of Spain, and you know, before that we were just uncultured, uncivil, uh, in, uncivilized people, and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, by holding one of the two positions, you are cutting yourself, uh, cutting half, uh, cutting cutting half your body, you know, and good luck trying to live like that. <laughs> and yeah. So, but instead of doing this to the body, they do this to the to the soul, to the bold guys, to the soul of the people. So, mm -hmm. what's the what's the outcome? You know, what's what what is what we should do in this case, in our in our context, and this is also part of our Christian doctrine is that. We are Peruvianists, which means we completely take what uh, the Incas did. We are trying. We are trying to dig more into the knowledge that was lost to the ages. And on the other side, we also side with our uh, paternal line, let's say, which is uh, comes from Spain, mm -hmm. which is that projected the world uh, and also mixed the. You know, they projected, captured a lot of this world, and also they projected their own vision and their own uh, fate, you know, faith, sorry, their own faith and fate too, uh, to the, to this other part of the world. They integrated them and they did not, they did not separate them. They were right. one, were a uniting force. So that's, and they also bring, bringing new stuff like, no, like this new knowledge, like sciences, like uh, even the, their own take on philosophy, because Incas also had their own take on philosophy, which was uh, based on myth of mythos. So it's like as assembling all the parts that make sense together in this uh, computer that we are trying to set up. And mm -hmm. once we will push the uh, the start button, the, the power on button, mm -hmm. uh, we are we are going to already uh, start replicating these to our own to all of our uh, neighbors, which are we, we see them as a, we see them as our brothers and sometimes cousins you know in, in the case of the brazilians you know all, all it's like brazilians for us they are cousins but all the other people in uh, around south america are, are our brothers now there is also this is problem this problem that happened with the with the balkanization of the empire which is you are going to just like in the balkans you are going to have rivalries uh, you know these uh, fratricidal wars between one another but that has already been uh, so, being uh, overcome by this this attack that have been experiencing the experiencing since our very beginnings which is on which is something that i mentioned to laura towler when i had her on my show uh, mm -hmm. last year which is you know you i told her you and i faced face the the, uh, the same enemy which is your elite you know the, the anglo elites are always are to us our existential enemies Hmm. While they are still in power or alive or whatever, they are always going to come after us in any shape or form. You know, right now they are doing this with the global homo, you know, that sometimes it's economic sanctions, other times it's just uh, CIA, gay ops, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, back when this happened, who was in power in, in, the, in the UK? Benjamin Disraeli. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Lord Baron de Rothschild, you know, it's yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. people playing in the same field. So it's right. to us, it's they are our existential enemies, and we yeah. there is there is like the, like the Black Lives Matter saying, no, no justice, no peace. No, so we need to bring them to justice. This is where we come together, and this is when I once again bring back to mostly, and completely agree with what we, what he's saying. Well, you know, if they can keep us fighting with each other like World War One and World War Two. And killing off our the best of our generations, you know they they're slowly molding the wind the the world down to something that they can control and dominate. It's a severe problem, and that's one of the cornerstones of Imperium art and the entire dissident right is this facing the enemy, calling out the enemy, mm. understanding their techniques, and then enlightening other Europeans about it the hardest part is enlightening the rest of the the white diaspora across the world 
And so, you know, if I can respond to some of your, the things you're saying, because I, I feel that we're, we are growing roots together in, in some sense. I'm learning from what you're saying, but I also feel like I kind of need to muse on it a little bit. So the, the topic of civilizational struggle <laughs> is a very broad view. It's a kind of a 3,000 foot view that, you know, an eagle's eye view of our life and what we're, we're dealing with. You know, so we strive to create a like a global European awakening, our civilizational imperium, if you will. Exactly. Right. So that that's a new spin on this concept of imperium art in this show is, you know, civilizational imperium. What what are our common indigenous elements of, of European civilization? We have science, reason, law, math, the the arts, architecture. Um, you know, how did the modern world come about? You know, the, the understanding of, in a sense, we Europeans created the modern world. Imagine if, it's just one small example, uh, the airplane and the automobile were invented in America. What, it, what would the world look like today if America kept that technology to itself and nobody else had airplanes and automobiles? How different would the world be today? That's just one tiny example of what the, the Western Imperium is per se. So we created these things in some way. We own these things. And so we should have a sense of our broader self and our, our global self in this regard. So, you know, there's, there's that perhaps is the way to create that enlightenment, that, that, that uh, sort of white enlightenment, if you want to call it. Yeah, Donald, I would I would definitely have to add the moral and spiritual element to it, oh, which I think is too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because I, I think that we we often get lost in the material aspects of uh, of our of our uh, achievements and 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 they're phenomenal. Don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I, I don't mean to ignore those. They're critical, obviously. Yeah. So I, I think that we we need to have and, and I think a, a, an element of Imperium art is to find a way for us to reconnect with the divine. And, and how we define the divine is a complex question and, and a philosophical question and also a, uh, a religious question that you know we, we have to address. But also I think that um, we also have to uh, understand that there are different traditions within the, uh, uh, the European biospirit. There are different uh, experiences. There are mm -hmm. different understandings and interpretations, mm -hmm. and so, 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 how we find a way forward in this is going to be very, a, a very big challenge. But I think that it's extremely important for us to always incorporate the moral, the the spiritual, and the divine in everything that we're doing, because if we don't, we kind of lose lose our way. And this comes back again to that balance that I always refer to. Mm -hmm. where where we we have to embrace the future we have to grab the bull by the horns we have to make our destiny but we also have to be humble enough to understand that there is a purpose there is a divine uh uh spirituality around us and that this spirituality is something that we're a part of and that we have to incorporate into this into this bombastic uh um energy that we're we're trying to achieve here so this, I think, is a new uh, query, a new trajectory for Imperium art. Yes. Is to ask the question, what is the divine to us as Western kind? Yes, and, and it's so, a complicated one. And, and a, an exciting one. <laughs> too. Yes. So, yes. So, so this leads me to my last question for Zero. Um, how can the arts in our sphere bring about a global European or white racial awakening? Tough question. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated, you know, because at the end of the day, I am not European, you know, but I do have some European admixture. That's true. Mm -hmm. I visited my family. I managed to visit my family uh, back in Spain. You know, they, they still look really Euro European <laughs> compared to me. But uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless, uh, some of the stuff that I have seen uh, that are that do offer possibilities for these kind of things regarding art it's like they trying to they are trying to uh, these kind of arts try to invent an alternative future mm. 
and this is something that uh, I believe, you know, when you are talking about expressing the bio spirit, mm. when you propose uh, an alternative future that comes from Europe, just like I mentioned, you know, a neoclassical metal uh, with the in we mouse team, mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are a lot of uh, this type of uh, guitar players around uh, America. I don't know if you have noticed. Uh, sure, sure. Jason Baker, Marty Friedman, Paul Gilbert, you know, uh, the guys from the Dream Theater, etc., etc., etc. Oh, Dream Theater for sure. Yeah. So there is all there is always you know something that I don't know I don't know how to explain it, but but like clicks with mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. like deep down with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah so so it that's yeah it comes through so, so that what you need to to make that will click is this an alternative future that comes from from this uh, from this side no uh, and mm -hmm. try to uh, mm -hmm. uh, build up from, from them and there, there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of people that are going to say oh this is something that i would like for example uh i have always also seen uh, people drawn to for example uh, warhammer 40k and yeah. the, mm -hmm. I believe it was uh, the golden one, the one who started posting about this. But you also see the this the same uh, the same uh, how to say this? What's the word for this? Uh, What's the word in Spanish? The same taste, no taste for this for this mm -hmm. kind of stuff uh, on the side of, for example, German, uh, sorry, uh, American gamers like. Uh, I was talking to, I believe it was uh, the Gator Gamer, the, okay. the guy who is co-host to uh, to Ralph, uh, to Ethan Ralph from the Ralph mm -hmm. Retort. Okay. And for example, he, he also likes uh, Warhammer 40k, and he's he's not a Swedish build, uh, bodybuilder, but there is something that clicks with him. Mm -hmm. So they, that 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 tells you something, and also Warhammer 40k is like a. There are so market futurist elements to that, uh, just like they, just like it happens with, for example, Starcraft uh, in, in the gaming world and many mm -hmm. others, many yeah. other such experiences. Yeah. Right. right, we we want to have a uh, space holy Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's fascinating. Um, that that's another topic for Imperium Art gaming. You know, we haven't we haven't even yeah. approached that yet. So that yeah. you. You really, you, you've really inspired some some cool directions here for us. So. And Donald, if I if I may, just one quick thing. This mm -hmm. is the Warhammer 40k is actually a very good analogy for Imperium art mm -hmm. because Warhammer 40k can mean many different things to many different people. Okay, but it it does still have a similar purpose. It appeals to everyone in a different way, but it has a similar purpose. And, and I think Imperium will also, at least, my hope at least, is that the concept of Imperium art will appeal to many different people. For some, it could harken back to the, uh, uh, the Greco-Roman era, it could be the sure. Holy Roman Empire, it could yep. be many different empires, or it could just simply mean, you know, the empire of God, if you'd like. There are many different kinds of empires that are inherently connected to the European biospirit. And, and what, what I think is that what we should try to also address with Imperium art is how all of these different elements tie into the Imperium that we can find each other in that plane, in that existential plane of the Imperium. I, for one, would... And this, would, I, I, I need to complement what you were saying, Nolos, uh, that this is also where metapolitics came in, come into play because... Yes, with meta with metapolitics, you start to use your own terms over and over again, or your own uh, symbols, and this is also why I believe you, Donald, are working with uh, Mark Bramin regarding uh, this this kind of uh, idea that he has. Uh, Certainly, yeah. This, this is mm -hmm. that he's developing all the colors, the symbols that represent yeah. who, or what, and perhaps. Perhaps that's one of the way, one of the reasons why uh, Warhammer 40k resonates resonates more with Europeans than with uh, with us. For example, uh, I like Warhammer 40k, but it's like no, I am not really that that much into that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's I'm mm -hmm. much I'm much more into World of Warcraft, for example, the books the books about World of Warcraft mm -hmm. for those who 
you know, World of Warcraft have books or, or Resident Evil, for example, you know, the, the concept of death. Uh, okay. the, the yeah. death. I, I'm not a gamer, by the way. <laughs> so I'm going to let you guys, I'm not a gamer, so I, I really, I'm just uh, taking feedback from both of you, so I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, what what I was saying, you know, it, over there you al you always repeat your symbols, your uh, the colors, the themes, yes. and in, in this case it would be the the concept, no, the words, for example. Uh, it is uh, talking about the with the um, the French new right Guillaume Fa Guillaume Fay has a, a book which is called Why We Fight, and mm -hmm. on the half of the book is uh, some articles from him. Mm. And the other half of the book is just a dictionary, a metapolitical dictionary. Wow. On what you use, uh, what what words, what win, what means what? Yeah, to, right. For, for everyone to be the, the same frequency. Mm -hmm. We'll have to look into that to add to our own dialectic. There, there were two things I wanted to respond to to zero. One was this this future vision of the world. I, mm. I guess I, for, for one, would not want it to be a, a transhuman cyberpunk nightmare. You know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I really enjoy that kind of art. I got to say, I love fantasy art. I'm a huge nerd on that sense. And I enjoy that whole, you know, uh, uh, Blade Runner world, you know, just as, a, as an entertainment. But I wouldn't want that to happen you know that i would think that would be the death of civilization and mankind so it's dystopia it's a dystopian vision for the future so that is good in the sense that now we know what not to do now we know what vision not to you know sometimes you can define a thing negatively right you know and then earlier i was asking you about you know how how can the arts create a global white awakening and you're saying well i'm i'm not fully european or white etc so i just wanted to toss in that thought about the, what I, this is a concept that i'm working on what i call the western alliance and it's simply for people who are biracial or uh, people of color who grow up in the western civilization and want to defend it they we, we should have some form of an alliance and we talked earlier in this show about, you know, alliances and, and kind of transcending uh, racial barriers and these kinds of things. So it's it's a big topic. I feel like it's some, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, I just was chatting with somebody on Twitter today about it. I'm sorry, I forget who. I apologize. But the, the idea of, you know, like East Asians, for example, being making great uh, allies, yes, we're different and et cetera. And then you talking about, you know, how can we meet each other as nationalists? You know, these it's, we need to kind of build more roads. You know, we have to cut more paths into that jungle and figure out how to talk more in a way that we can be stronger together. So that's all I wanted to, to add. So any closing thoughts, guys? We, this has been a very uh, inspiring show. Well, I'll, I'll finish my, some just two thoughts. Excellent. First of all, Zero, thank you. This was a, f a fantastic conversation. And, um, and, I, and I really appreciate that you uh, spent the time to speak with us today. Um, and then my closing thought is we should strive toward a galactic Holy <laughs> Roman Empire. <laughs> and I mean this. No, I, all jokes aside, I, I well, kind of joking. No, I mean, uh, no, but uh, I really appreciate it. And I think that that um, we learned a lot in terms of how we should understand our brothers and sisters in South America. And I, I look forward to a lot more dialogue. And I think that that it's an important aspect that we have to bring into the concept of Imperium art. Um, how we define this, whether this is as uh, um, a separate Imperium within the Imperium, a separate Imperium, imperium alongside the Imperium. Um, that remains to be seen. I think that that's a secondary issue. I think what's more important is that we find commonality and synthesis and synergies. Sure. sure. So thank you so much, Zero Schizo, for joining us. It was fantastic. I will uh, let everybody know where they can find you online. What are your links? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can find me at twitter.com slash zero uh, underscore schizo uh, on my other places. The other places that you can find me are definitely uh, the revolutionaryconservative.com, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Also patreon.com slash Kitso because that's that's the place where I am without the underscore of course. And that's yeah. the place where I am uh, publishing everything that I am every chapters of chapters of books that I am translating at the moment. Wow. Uh, yeah, I am almost close to finish this book uh, that is about uh, Horiasima. Horiasima was the second in command of the Iron Guard. And he makes an, an, an uh, yeah, um, let's say uh, a metapolitical analysis of the uh, Iron Guard and the Spanish Falange. So it's really interesting. It's really good. Uh, oh. It's really good stuff. Mm. You know, and it's just uh, support me just for one dollar, and that's you can access to all, all the stuff that I have I have translated so far. Oh. So far. Great. <clears throat> and also, uh, you know, just like I, I mentioned earlier, because we all have uh, watched. Uh, down here, no, because we all have watched uh, anime growing up and all this kind of stuff. I also found very interesting uh, concepts, uh, or, or should I say, very interesting uh, uh, scenes and situations that could explain many different concepts from philosophy. For example, I am trying, I am right now writing uh, an article regarding uh, uh, how to understand and explain some concept from Heid- uh, some con- concepts from Heidegger. Now, if you have read Heidegger, Heidegger is a very complicated guy because he has his own ontology or let's say his own vocabulary to refer to mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, so, but the, this anime, the, there is there is like a lot of situations that can explain, for example, being towards it, being in the world, uh, was there in that sign, uh, and many, yeah, and many other topics, which are not, which are complicated if you are trying to understand it, understand them just from reading, just from reading him, you know. Because sometimes we need uh, a visual experience or yes. audiovisual experience to understand what we are saying. And this is also the importance of Imperium Arts because it's mm-hmm. it's very easy to toss the term, but it's really complicated to see what you are referring to. Yeah. You know, Heidegger and Imperium Art, that's another topic. Uh, we could have, you know, Tyler Hamilton on. Or we, there's several people, honestly, that could speak to that. And and then just the notion of taking his language and also uh, Guillaume Fay's uh, terminology and, and somehow visualizing all this for our people. That, that could be extraordinarily powerful. Yes. So, you know, we're very grateful for the work that you're doing. Yes. So thanks it's so much. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for coming out. Of course, I'll have the links below. And uh, thank you for the listeners and the audience. Please share, comment. Uh, you have a role in this. You are, you know, not passive listeners. You're involved in this culture. And the very least you can do is to just get this out more. It's uh, some of it's very complex. Uh, very challenging information, but I think it, it's great to get these conversations going. It grounds us, it enriches us, and it's vital to our future survival. So once again, thank you, Zero Schizo, and thank you, Nullis, also for your help today. Uh, everyone have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time.